your host, Jamie George, uh, and I'm so grateful for MetaShare, who has just invited me to bring inspiring stories and introduce you to amazing people. Well, this is one of those people. Our guest today is Mariah Peters Smallbone. Mariah is a Mexican-American recording artist, actress, academic model. Her capacity kind of blows my mind. Uh, she, she released two full-length albums with Sony Music Group back in 2012 and 2014. Her sophomore album, Brave, actually hit number nine on Billboard's Christian Music Charts. Most recently, you may have heard her singing with uh, her independent band, is an all-female band called Trala. Uh, she's acted in a movie. Uh, she's done a lot of acting, actually. Uh, and then uh, most recently, returned to modeling. You were at Paris Fashion Week not too long ago. The last I heard, um, she was back to writing music. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious to hear about that. Uh, so welcome, Mariah. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. I feel, I wish that I could have added to that uh, a new thing that I've just put on my resume. I now know how to do fades, like haircut fades for men. Wow. That's, we, we should definitely be including that. Well, with this whole quarantine thing, Joel's hair has just been a little bit wild. And so first I did a quarantine cut. So I just buzzed the whole thing. And uh, then last this is, night. This is he, on your husband's head. You just buzzed yeah, yeah, the whole. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, then, and then last night he asked me if I could do a fade. And I was like, can I ever? <laughs> YouTube. And I looked up a little tutorial and like it actually turned out great. I didn't know there was a whole strategy to it. You don't oh, just wow. like. Yeah, it, there's a whole thing. So let's let's add that to the bio. For so future. so for so you're one for one. Yes, yes. On the face. <laughs> I thought he had to grow his hair like to have for some Civil War part or something. Like I thought he had to have like Ben wanted him having long hair for their Civil War movie. Well, he he was supposed to, um, and uh, and he did, but they pushed the movie. So. Oh why have long hair for longer than you need to if you're a guy? That's the question I would ask. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And speaking of hair, right before we got on, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time. I mean, your hair is the longest mm. it's been since before you were married. I mean, it's crazy. It just keeps going. <laughs> I know, I'm excited about it. I, I chopped my hair off right before my wedding day seven years ago. Um, and I felt very liberated from that. And then I figured, you know, I'm now, I'm 27. Now I need to start trying a little bit harder. So long hair. <laughs> wait, try, <laughs> wait, trying a little bit harder, what to actually wake up and like, no, just, just to be presentable. Oh. Like it takes, it, you know, it's like, it's like more effort. And so I'm like, all right, let me grow out, let me grow out my hair. That'll longer that, hair that is more effort. Something. Uh, I see. That, communicates uh. something. that means I tried. Right? Okay. Yeah. 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 That makes sense to me. Yeah. I get it. I get it. I, I see I, JLo. What she says to me is I try really hard. So if that's my kind of like, you know, my goal, my projection. Yeah. yeah. Try harder every day. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense to me. So, so how are you coping with quarantine? Uh, Joel said to me, you know, he, he, he said, you, he, he, first of all, you've seen each other more than you've seen each other since you've been married, because mm -hmm. you both have been touring artists. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then he said the other day, he said something like, yeah, you know, we see each other in the morning, we have breakfast, we kiss each other. She goes upstairs to her office and I go off to work. Like, so what's that been like? It's, it's new. I mean, for a lot of people, I would guess that this season has brought complete newness, um, new structure, new relationship, new dynamics. It, it's, this, is, this is the first. This is a, it, it's the first time we've had a first in a very long time. Um, and mm. I think for, for me personally, there's been the sort of spiritual awakening that I've experienced in myself. And then there's also been the growth in, in marriage. Um, and it'll be funny to kind of like a B my conversation with you with Joel, because I mean, our dynamic is, is we were very, very similar, but I've noticed 
now that we've had more and more time together, just how like different we kind of are in, in certain areas. <laughs> and, and I think, I think one of the, one of the big differences that come up is like, I, I, I love to laugh. I love to face, you know, difficulty with strength and with resolve and focus and with empathy, but also with a tinge of humor if I can. And Joel is just so dang serious. Like every day with his, like his lives is like, Hey everyone, Day, it's just really hard I'm like oh my gosh I'm so like this is like heavy I and I get it like it is heavy but that's what makes this time so special is that we need to laugh me and we need to he, laugh a little bit we do we do but he helps me sink into you know the sadness like I I, I haven't been emotional throughout this uh, process and I um oh. recently because I have friends who are really facing some some difficult things. I've got a girlfriend who is a, a, a single expectant mother mm. and she's due in like seven weeks and, and she has no job. She's completely out of work. And then wow. I've got another friend who um, is having a wedding this weekend and they, because they can only have 10 people, you know, she's, wow. it's just, it's, she's consolidated wow. down to 10 people. So it's like, there's, there's these things that, you know, we have, that are happening very close to us that are heartbreaking and it, and it hurts to, to think about it and to process it. And I don't ever want to skip that because I think that it would be an absolute shame to avoid the pain and the suffering of this time. Yeah. There's a solidarity in like feeling the suffering yeah. of everyone. But, but I appreciate what you're saying too about humor. Like somehow, it, how do we do both? Right. It feels like somehow both have to. Exist. Right. Right. Well, because the other thing is, and this is what I've been able to help Joel with, is if this is a beautiful time, if there's beauty in this time as well, we can't skip that either mm. out of guilt, mm. out of shame. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And so I, I'm looking at this time and I'm like, okay, our first year of marriage, we had over 200 shows. That means we spent closer to 300 days on the road either me with him, him with me, or us apart. So this is the first time in seven years that we have been together consistently at home. We're cooking for the first time. We have never, <laughs> ever used a crock pot, an instant pot, a, a frother. What is a milk frother? Like, we're using all these things and you, we're just discovering each other in amazing, amazing ways. And it's like the consistency, you know, for us, we're both, we're perfectionists, we're hardworking, we're, we like rhythm, we like consistency. And for being in the line of work that we're in, we don't get any of that. That's like, right. that's not allowed. Yeah. And so to be able to sink into this like rhythm of like, every day I go up to my office, he goes down here. It's like, it's great. It's amazing. So it's and in both. It's both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, have you found, <clears throat> do you just kind of, have you guys put any structure to your day of this kind of sense of, hey, here's kind of the part of the day where we'll, we'll kind of watch the news or connect with friends and kind of feel the weight of the world, you know, have that solidarity. Uh, I think it's Henry Nowen that talks about, it. hey, we all have a, a place to suffer. And if we'll all bear that together, somehow we help kind of bear the weight of the world together. Is there a space where you, and then like kind of at night we go like, look, we're going to shut the news off and let's be present. Or do you just kind of find, does it just kind of flow through the day kind of in and out of that space of like lightheartedness, but then being aware of somebody in need, what's that been like? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's actually been fairly consistent every day. Um, we, we wake up, we have our time of, quietness and contemplation reading journaling we have breakfast and then we go we literally will not see each other <laughs> we're in the same house but like we are working separately from pretty much 9 30 10 well it almost be or six based on how much you haven't seen each other for seven years you know there, it'd almost be too much like oh my heavens I, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's part of it. Uh, maybe we're just really enjoying being productive and consistent. I don't yes, know. Yes, but yes. Um, when we kind of wrap up the work day, 
and um, we've got a great Dane. She's 140 pounds and she requires two walks every day. And that's kind of our, our way to get out. But um, after we, we walk her, we come home and we spend maybe 30 minutes on YouTube watching Anthony Fauci videos and um, sometimes Jimmy Kimmel, like his videos that he's doing at home or uh, Jimmy Fallon, uh, and we watch uh, the Good News by John Krasinski. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you know. So, so we're 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 taking in media uh, each day in spurts um, when we when we finish our work, um, but we do try to limit it, and we and part of that is because one um, for Joel it can become a bit of a black hole. Mm. And he can just go deeper and deeper and spend hours and hours and hours just consuming media and information, um, which is beautiful in some ways. He's a researcher, but in, in other ways, I think it can be a bit out of balance. Mm -hmm. And then um, also, I, I'm in school right now, and one of the classes uh, required me to, to write a paper on something, like to find a, a research paper and, and sort of analyze it. And I, so early on, very early on with, with COVID, I did um, a research paper on just the kind of psychological ramifications and how people are dealing with COVID in, through the lens of anxiety and mm -hmm. where the anxiety comes from. Because the thing I was most curious about was just how some people could be rolling with the punches and mm -hmm. others are doing the hoarding and the you know freaking out and the toilet paper and you know I just mm -hmm. wanted to understand that and one of the key pieces of advice that this uh this professor gave in, in this article was uh to limit your source of news reception so so instead of going, you know, from this outlet to that outlet to all, you know, jumping around to Twitter accounts to new, like <clears throat> stay focused on one or two very credible sources and follow that story. Because if you open yourself to the wide rushing waterfall of information yeah, that yeah. we're, we're available, that we have available to us, you're more susceptible to xenophobia to confusion to fall prey to rumors and fear mongering and people who are trying to capitalize on anxiety mm. uh, during this time so yeah we we do take it in each day but in doses and with pretty consistent sources yeah that sounds like such a great way listening to you talk about that routine i'm, I'm a little convicted i'm <laughs> which has happened for me a couple of these interviews i'm like oh that's a really good idea um, <laughs> no, and, and part of it is uh, I've got kind of multiple kind of small little companies at a time that I'm trying to juggle, but, but mm -hmm. that routine is so appealing to me. And I'm just sitting mm -hmm. here as you're talking, going, but I want to sit with Angie and go, how could we kind of lock that in? Cause it makes sense mm -hmm. to me that there's almost kind of a, uh, the moderation in it all that, that there's yep. something in that and you're kind of putting it in compartments which allows mm -hmm. you to be present to each other later that evening like that. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Now you and I've had conversations, I'm actually thinking of one in particular on the tour bus where you, you've had to deal with fear in your life. You, you that for whatever reason, <clears throat> just that emotion is one you've had to contend with. How mm -hmm. have you, and maybe go back to a time in your story, we're all dealing with fear at some level, you know, like you said, some of us roll through, you know, we roll with the punches a little bit better, but everybody's dealing with some kind of, we got all have financial questions. Doesn't matter where you, mm -hmm. what station in life you're in, right? Mm -hmm. We've got, we've got questions about family members. Some of us are dealing with major questions about health. Mm -hmm. Could you go back to a time in your life where you dealt with fear, uncertainty and, and, and how you got through it and how you were different because of it? Is there just some, some place in your story you could pull back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's several places that I could sort of dip my toe in. Uh, there was, honestly, my dad reminded me of this last night. He was like, you know, you showed a lot of faith getting married. And a lot of people don't, don't think about that because they just see Joel in all of his glory and all of his beauty, which he is in a glorious, amazing man. 
Um, but when we first met, like I was 17 and he was living in his parents' basement and, uh, that was, that was a scary, that was a scary thing. So there was fear there that I, that I overcame. He asked me to marry him. I said, okay, literally. Okay. Um, you know, you had, you had time, time out on the road when I had such anxiety of the stage uh, uh, you know, felt very vulnerable, very unprotected. Mm, and, yeah. um, the, that fear drove me to the point of being so sick that I was in Vanderbilt's infectious disease department for 12 days. And I mean, they, there have been several kind of like checkpoints along the way that I could say I dealt with uncertainty and fear. Um, but I think the, the one I'd love to kind of sink into is the most recent one. And, that is really uh, the project of Trala for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, in 2015, I started working with uh, some of the women that I had been touring with as a solo artist, and we started co-writing, we started producing, um, and really built this incredible just brain trust of uh, creativity. Um, it was great that we were already friends. It was great that we were all women, but it was just this kind of natural next step in the creative process. And I had just come out of what I felt like was the end of my music journey. I'd gone to Israel, to Mount Moriah, and in all of my uncertainty was just like, God, I am done with music. Your options are acting, <laughs> philanthropy, retail. You let me know. <laughs> what are, are your options? Three? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, I, you know, as, as God often does, he kind of came back with a bit of a zinger of, no, you're not done with music, and I'm going to give you a new mission within music. It's one of the very few times in my life where I felt like I had a certain direction. Um, and so I ran with that. But in the process of running with that, I realized that I might have put some words in God's mouth in, mm. that, in that process. I specifically heard... I'm going to give you a new mission within music. That's pretty much it. Yeah. What I turned it into <laughs> was the mission statement of God has called me to do music with other women, to elevate other women in the creative space. And these are the exact people that I'm supposed to partner with. And this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. And I meant to put out a five song EP oh, in 2019. Oh, like, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and, if that's, and if that's from God, dude, there's no, you can't deviate. Oh, no one can stop. Me. Oh boy. No one. God told me. <laughs> God so told no you. one can stop me. And it's just funny. I can't, I mean, I'm sure, I am sure that there are, so many people who are with me in this who have felt like they have done something in the name of yes. the Lord Almighty and he's like, I never asked you to do that. Who made that up? Yeah, yeah. You embellished a little bit oh. of what I was saying to you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I got to the point end of last year where the uncertainty was at an all-time high mm. and the energy was at an all time low. Mm. And, mm. uh, you know, I, I, I was just done. I had reached the end of myself. And uh, a lot of just pain, like that the whole process had been so painful. I mean, there was some beautiful things along the way. I look back at the songs that we were able to write and I listen to those songs still. And I'm like, I love these songs. I'm so, I can remember every writing session, every production session. And so the, the, the music has really been the redemptive piece of it, but every step of the way, it felt like pushing water up a hill. And in the world of entertainment and music where very similarly to the world of any entrepreneur, there is just so much uncertainty and so much doubt. Like I, I was, I was done. And I had this sort of visual come to mind uh, at the end of the year when the proverbial poop had hit the fan. And I, I had this visual of me climbing up the side of a hill, scaling a hill, a muddy, slippery hill where I'm just using my 
fingernails to get up as much as I can. And I climb up and then I slide back down and I climb up and I slide back down. And I'm like in the mud. I'm like, I'm like Anakin Skywalker in the scene where he's got, he's amputated and he's <laughs> trying to climb up the side. Oh, of the yes, lava. yes, like, I, I got me. it. Yep. I'm like, I'm like, where are you god like why can't you see that i'm suffering like yeah. help me and all the while god was there but he was looking at me going i never asked you to scale this side of the hill mm. like the pathway i have for you is actually just around the corner on the other side and that's where I want you to be. That's, that's where I made for you to be. Like you are, you are doing this to yourself. And I had this epiphany where it was like, okay, life isn't always going to be easy, but God never asked us to be miserable. And I think that misery is man-made. I think misery happens when you are stuck doing something that you are not supposed to do. Mm. And it's hard and it's difficult and you've trapped yourself in that position yeah, and you yeah, have the yeah. freedom to leave at any point. Like I could have quit at any moment and God would not have smited, smitten me. <laughs> uh, but I believed he would. Right. So, so, so talk about the difference. This is really good, Mariah, because I do think we get caught in this, this mm. self-made misery. If you could, and, and maybe there isn't, but is there a difference between mis misery and suffering? Like, is there a piece where, is yes. there, a, can you find the line yes. where you're like, this is yes. healthy, like I'm suffering for something good, but this is, no, this is only yes. that line. And that's the dichotomy. I think those are really the two, is like, I can look back and I can see the times in my life where I've experienced suffering and, and there's something that happens in suffering mm -hmm. where you're going through something hard but you know you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Yeah, you can kind of tell it's producing something in you. Like, oh, this is hard, but then this is what happens. Yes. I'm being forged yes. in the thing. Yes. Crucible. And I think, and I think the, these telltale signs that you are in misery, not suffering, is how you interact with the people around you. Ah, and for good. me, I was operating at such a deficit for so long mm -hmm. that... I was critical of the people around me. Mm. I was uh, not pouring into the relational trust and it was very much transactional mm. and I needed people to perform and execute. Mm. And if they didn't like I'm done yeah. with you yeah, kind yeah. of thing, you know, and that's, that's not a healthy <laughs> way to, to live your life. And, and, I and think not who you are. At no. base, that's not your default. I mean, that's just not who you are at default, right? But you, right. So you could look and go, wait, I'm not showing up in the world yes. the way I once did. And yes. you know, see what, some of our spiritual language kind of aligned with Christ. It's, it's, you, you can tell I'm off. I'm not centered. Oh, I mean, to, to, to take that point even one step further, I had gotten to a point where I was so confused about who I was mm. because I'd had so many people, just the people I was working with telling me these things of like, you're selfish. Mm. You are, you are not considerate. You are all these. And I'm, and so I'm hearing all of this and I, I had to go to LA at the end of the year for something where I grew up and I, I cried on the plane on the way there. And I looked to my husband and I said, I need to see my best friend, Jamie Dariata. Like I, I need to see her because we've been friends since high school and she's the only one mm. who can remind me of who I am right now. Um, wow. I literally, wow. we landed at LAX and went straight to a ramen restaurant and I sat with her for hours and I just wow. said like, can you remind me of who I am? <laughs> oh man. Gosh. I've, I've lost it like I've lost it mm. and like gosh I'm so grateful that we have I hope that we all have people like that in our mm. lives who can bring us back to center who can when we're too weak to spiritually get there like by ourselves and we're experiencing the kind of doubt that 
is somehow blocking us from even being honest with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need those people. Gosh, is it, 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 <laughs> and isn't it amazing how you can go back into your story and you go, I need that emotional safe space. And, yeah. and this was with your friend, Jamie. I mm-hmm. remember in 2016, when I went through all the stuff, <clears throat> we had major transitions in our church and all that stuff. Yeah. Weekly, I would, my grandmother had, had died years ago, but weekly, I would imagine myself back at her farm. And it was this, it somehow was safe. And it's funny, I was showing up in the world, I would say people around me would be like, Jamie, why are you so task driven? Why? You, it's, yes. you don't seem patient with people. You, and mm-hmm. I think we're, it feels like you're at the end of yourself. You're barely holding on. And you're, mm. and the task thing is like, no, please do this. Cause I'm, I'm in like fight, flight or freeze. And if, and if you, if this is primal, if you'll at least get that job done, it's one less thing I'm not, you know, carrying or feeling the weight of. And, 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 and you and I have both been through this physically, your, your adrenal glands are shot. You realize mm. I, didn't, I didn't even know all this stuff, but the chemically my body wasn't right. And your adrenal activity stage <laughs> four. <laughs> Stage is that what it's called? Is that the, yeah. Well, stage four is what happens right before you die. Oh, me. Stage Great. three, stage three is usually where we can operate. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I was, yeah, you're right. I think I was right at four. Um, so when, as you're sitting there telling that, like I'm feeling the emotion with you, but I remember that feeling mm. of just being mm. at the end of myself and longing mm-hmm. for a safe space. And mm-hmm. it's interesting how God, often places people in our story someplace and I loved that like just remind me who I am oh oh my gosh it's yeah I, I'm forever grateful um for people like that that I think the other few things that helped me get through that time and then transition well out of it really into this new season I'm in were um my mentor, uh, Joel, my parents in school, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, <laughs> my, my mentor, her name's uh, Carrie Hosenbog, and she, she used to work in politics. Um, she's a brilliant woman. She studied to be a, a Benedictine nun. I mean, she's just, she's really a special, special woman and someone that I've prayed for for a long time. Um, And, uh, she, she was, she was with me. She lives in Pennsylvania, but she came and visited and stayed with me, uh, during the week where, uh, the poop fan thing happened. And, uh, and she just held my hand through that. Mm -hmm. She walked me through it. She helped me see the healthy way of dealing with pain and then, the not so healthy way of yeah, dealing with it. Yeah. Um, and I say school because I've, I've, so I, I'm uh, in the fall, I'm going to be graduating from Lipscomb University here in Nashville. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. I mean, it's We're doing- <laughs> for a touring artist who's had, you know, you, you have not had the traditional school experience. Yeah. Well, that's, <clears throat> what's been so special about this degree is it's, it's a, it's a degree in entertainment management and I added an emphasis in marketing, but I actually helped, partner with Lipscomb in developing this program and really working through the beta testing and giving feedback oh, that's so that cool. we could make a program that's conducive for touring artists. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm taking incredible classes that are so relevant to, to what I'm doing, but one of the, one of the, the courses I'm taking is on entrepreneurship and it's just, I'm loving it. And, uh, I literally, I, I wrote down a couple of quotes from here because this is, this has helped me put together just the practicality of, of working through the uncertain times in our lives with the reality and, and sort of this, the spirituality of it. Um, oh, good. Give it, give, is, give it to so, us. So this, is, this is just two quotes. It's, it's amazing. Good. This was from a chapter on uh, investments and, and, and uh, raising seed capital. Uh, and it says a mentor helps overcome some of the uncertainty felt by impersonal investors they have the knowledge of the entrepreneur Uh, and then it talks about a a moral support network or a a cheerleading squad and it says a moral support network plays a critical role during the many difficult and lonely times that occur throughout the entrepreneurial process 
And so what's interesting is for me, I'm reading this text from the perspective of, uh, okay, these are people who are starting businesses. These are people who are, uh, you know, starting a, a, a fizzy drink company or a, 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 a workout facility or whatever. But I had never truly made the connection between who, what I do as an artist and entrepreneurship like mm. it's the same thing it's the same thing as, as a musician like because you're a businesswoman you're a, you're in charge of marketing you're in charge of the systems that have to be put into place right, right. resolution right exactly all of it and and i'm reading this and i'm like if this is if this is good for uh if this is good enough for a student to read in a textbook, like this should be applicable for me in, in life. And so mm -hmm. the importance of mentors and, and a moral support network and family, like that is key in, in any walk of life. But for me, particularly in this stage of like absolute uncertainty and doubt. And so really leaning on those people who, who know me best, who, as the book said, they have, a, they have the knowledge of the entrepreneur, the knowledge of who I mm. am. Um, it's so key. It's so key. Those people are so key. So I'm very grateful, very grateful for all those people. Can I say that back to you just because I think there are a lot of folks who are listening who, if, if they're not there now, they may have to be soon because a lot of the conversations right now are, <clears throat> hey, I'm out of work or this thing I was doing is, uh, it, I don't, it, it fell apart or, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, uh, speaking of entrepreneur, you know, this, uh, Paul and I created this show together. It was supposed to premiere in March, you know, it's probably now not going to start right. in June. <laughs> right. Yeah. Hello. So I'm one of those entrepreneurs. Um, you yeah. know, in, 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 for folks who are like us, um, uh, who are dealing with all that uncertainty, you deal with uncertainty anyway as an entrepreneur, but now you have this. Would you say to them to kind of recap what you're experiencing, what you're learning in, in this course, hey, go find a mentor and find a squad, like find those people around you who believe in you because you're going to need them to carry you when the times get tough. Would you say those would be two really important action steps? I would say they are very important, but I wouldn't say they're the most important. So, so um, they have value for you as an entrepreneur. What would you say? Because if somebody goes, hey, right now I'm, st I'm, I'm at home, so I'm starting this side hustle. Yes. What, okay. Let's what? talk about that. <laughs> Let's talk about that because that's, that's, that's where my- You've had to do that. I mean, multiple that, times, right? right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. 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 So here's the way I've come to experience it. And it, I'm sure it's different for everyone, but personally- I see this moral support network as the people who lift you up when you're down, the people who bring you back to center when you're acting out and not in the way that you really are. Mm -hmm. But, and those are accountability partners. Those are like, they're absolutely vital and necessary, not just in, in work, but I think in life in general, um, I think what is the most important thing, and it's the thing that I've continued to come back to, and, and the people in my life have pointed me back to this place. They don't have the answers. They aren't going to help me make my business ideas successful because they don't necessarily care mm. all that much about that. What they mm -hmm. care most about is my true self. Mm. pointing me back mm. to who to who I really am. Yeah, they yeah, can't yeah. be God to me. I don't want them to be God to me. Yeah. They don't want that pressure. Yeah. They want to point me back to who God is in me. And so they're almost the bumpers, the, right? They're almost the guardrails. Right. Right. Yes. But they're not um, the engine. Like you 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 the passion is if you're going to go build something, you're yes. carrying it. Yes. Well, this is what, this is what I would, this is what I would point people to. And I'm, I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to my little brother. You know, we were just having conversations about this. Um, he's thinking, what side hustle can I do? Like, what can I got to make money, you know? And this is what I want to bring us all back to. I'm referencing my journal. <laughs> I use colorful pens Ooh, every day. Wow. I'm such a I high like schooler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so this is this is just an excerpt from um, uh, a, a Richard Rohr kind of blog that I've been following, but he defines the true self, and you've talked a lot about this, Jamie, over the years, but uh, this is the true self. It can let go and be almost anything except selfish or separate. It does not cling or grasp. It's a human being rather than a human doing. Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. me, I had to let go. I had to let go of all of the, the desperate clinging and grasping. And it's, it will kill you and it will kill your relationships and it will make you sick the longer that you live in your false self, which mm -hmm. your false self is, is pretty much whatever you try to identify it as it, anything other than yourself. It's what you do. It's, it's the music you put out. It's the film you're in. It's the post. It's an identity. It's events a, you post. It's a an identity that's attached to your doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think as long as we operate in that place of what can I fill my time with? What work can I put my hands to? we're just living in this chaotic state and we're never coming back to what takes the most courage and mm. what we all have an opportunity to do in this time. No one has the excuse to not do this because everyone has time. Everyone's at home. Everyone has an opportunity to find a quiet corner right mm. now mm. and do the thing that takes the most courage, which is to accept who I am. How do I do that? Yeah. And that, to me, that only happens in the stillness. It only happens in the quiet. It only happens when I silence everything else, all the tasks, all my homework, my assignments, the song I need to produce, the people I need to respond to, the email inbox. And I just go, but who am I? Because if I can get back to that place of who God created me to be, accepting who that is and walking in that radical humility, then that is ironically the most grounded and glorious and original and free version of myself that I could ever possibly be. Mm, beautiful. Wow. It's beautiful. Thank you for that. I mean, that really is mm. what, a, what an important reminder for all of us. And it is the opportunity that's yeah. in front of us. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to hang and just share what's going on with you. Uh, hey, it, it, Mariah, if for people that have been inspired as I have in, in this conversation with you, where can they uh, find out what you're doing, what you're up to, hear your music? Um, where can they find, is there like a central Mariah world to go? We'll find I mean, MariahSmallbone.com is always an option. Okay. <laughs> But I, I'm pretty active on, on my Instagram, Mariah okay. Smallbone, M-O-R-I-A-H, like the mountain, not the singer, nothing against it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Instagram, it'd be a good, that'd be kind of the best place to go connect. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, blessings in all your endeavors and uh, can't wait till this thing lives where we finally get to hang out. Thanks, Jamie.